Aloha, everybody. Thank you for coming and spending your Friday evening with us. Um, how, many, how many of you believe that things happen for a reason? Yeah, I think we all do. Well, Rocky is in the flow, and he's currently completing a commission, an art commission. And so he is unable to be with us this evening, but um, with his blessing and with the same kind of authority and expertise, but definitely a different type of energy, his wife Lucia is stepping up this evening. So I want to mahalo her for bringing her presence, her expertise, and her aloha to us this evening. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Unveiling Concepts and Philosophy Behind Maoli Arts. While Rocky is unable to be with us, with us here this evening, his wife Lu Lucia Taralo Jensen is, in her own way, taking you on a journey from pre-contact to the contemporary present, Lucia will speak to why Hawaii Maoli imagery was and continues to be created inclusive of the philosophy and language behind the artistic iconography. Protocol and procedure will be revisited and in this way debunk the fallacy of so many misinterpreted concepts. An artist in her own right, an educator, Lucia is also an author. Having written Na Kaika Mahini o Haumea, Daughters of Haumea, the sequel to the 1972 book, Men of Ancient Hawaii, Lucia dispels misinformation about women in ancient Hawaiian culture. She dedicates 20 sections of the book to a different role Native Hawaiian women had in society, from canoe maker to feather worker, from farmer to warrior, from ruler to lover. Lucia's daughter, Natalie Mahina Jensen, who is with us here tonight as well, also contributed to this family project by providing 20 elegant black and white photographs of women, all Native Hawaiian models in traditional settings, practicing a different aspect of their culture. Again, mahalo Lucia for stepping forward and mahalo for the expertise and aloha that you bring to us this evening. Ano'ai kako, ameke aloha apau. I greet everyone with love and respect and very glad that you were able to make this Friday uh, an event. Um, I humbly stand in my husband's place, he who is extremely passionate about uh, the ancient art form of Kalaina, which is sculpting, carving, and uh, has been at it for 40 years. And the reason he's not here is because he's doing four major images that will grace the Disney uh, complex on Oahu. And they've given him a very strict due date. So he's finished three, and he has a fourth to do. And these are nine feet tall, and perhaps 25 or 30 inches in diameter, so they're huge. So he's been working 24-7 for the last eight months, and he's right at the very end, right putting the finishing touches, the inlays, and able to ship three off, and he still has to do one more in four weeks, so this is why he's not here. But when we do these things, we usually do them together, uh, we sort of comfort each other in the process of thinking and uh, usually mainly because we think out of the box and we present concepts that uh, go against the norm and this has been our way for many many years because there are so many fallacies that have been adopted as factual truth when they're actually not. So we try in our way gently, but my husband, well, that's why <laughs> Darlene said in different ways, different energy, because Rocky would be standing here and telling you this. And I try to present it in a gentler way. 
So, uh, initially, Rocky was going to speak of the uh, iconography of Kunuya Kea and his many, many aspects. Now, how many of you in this audience are familiar with Ku? So you know what I'm talking about when I say Ku. Ku's proper name for the overall Ku is Kunui Akea. So Ku, and especially in Kona, when Kamehameha returned to Kona from uh, after the Battle of Nu'uanu, and he stayed on Oahu for a while. Then he returned to Kona in 1810, I think it was, or 13. I'm not quite sure. He went through the process of restoring all of the major heiau, all of the major temples. And that's when the last influx of the carving of the ku happened. So three of the last ku that remain in the world's collection are these three that you see here. They were exhibited at the Bishop Museum last year. I hope, did anyone get to see them? Did anyone? So you know what I mean when I'm talking about stellar and spectacular and the energy and mana was so overpowering and overwhelming that we had Hawaiians embracing it and Hawaiians running away from the room crying because they couldn't deal with not only the energy but the whole uh, concept of the energy of the images flying in the belief of their new Christian way. And so they were very fearful of these images. My husband and I have never been that way. Uh, he is Maoli first and everything else afterwards. So when it comes to his, the philosophy of his people, uh, that comes first before anything else. That's what he believes. That's how he lives. That's how he breathes. And this is how we've been all of these years. So we don't have that problem embracing an ancient concept. Uh, it is very much part of our lives. The three coups that you see in front of you are, one is from the Bishop Museum, the center one is from the British Museum, and the third one on the far right is the, um, the Peabody Museum in Salem. The thing that, yes. Oh, they're, for those who haven't seen them, they're larger than life. They're probably nine heads tall. They're huge, huge. And when you think of the tree that this, that these were encased in, because um, Maoli believed that the image is encased in the wood, and all the carver does is peel off the layers of wood to reveal the image. The mana in the the mana of an image resides regardless of whether it's carved or not. Carving is just the icing on the cake. The thing that astounded us about these three coups is that the center coup, which is at the British Museum, has never been photographed from the back. And when you see it in popular literature, you will find it frontal or side. You never see the back. And neither do you see the back of the other images as well. So when, of course, we went to see it the first to see them, we, all of the carvers and sculptors and artists, they just reviewed it meticulously because they wanted to see every little nook and cranny of the piece to finally see these things up close for the very first time, many of them. We noticed that the British Museum coup in the center is carved all the way around. It is so meticulously carved. It is so well polished. It is so perfect in every single way. The other two, the backs are just sort of uh, concave, uh, but the middle coup is just an artist's perfection. Uh, Kunuyakea is ku without the Nuiakea in Hawaii is popularly understood to be the god of war. And I'm sure those who know ku know this. Well, Kunuyakea is not only the god of war, he is the god of man. If I can use the term god, which I hate to use, and I'll explain to you why I hate to use the word god. He is an elemental 
he represents, his iconography represents man, not mankind, man exclusive of women. So everything that man does is under the auspices of Kunui Akea. And there is an icon for each one of those uh, uh, disciplines, everything that he does. So, of course, war is included. But he is not only the god of war. And this is one of the myths that is so very popular because even in scholarly um, um, presentations in books, you'll find Ku, the god of war. Well, is that the Ku you're speaking of? Because there are like hundreds of Kus. Which Ku are you speaking of? Is it Ku, the god of war, or Ku Nuyakea, or an aspect of? Uh, my husband... In order to drive this concept home, in order to dispel the myth, my husband created a monument that now is sitting in front of the Fort DeRussi Army Museum in Waikiki. Okay? These are five of usually the 11 coups standing in front of a temple, not in front of a temple, on the, on the the, the highest level of the temple. In the temple, there are seven levels. So the highest level of the temple has the ku images. So what he did was he carved five of the 11. And he, he chose the most benign of the ku images, all that dealt with healing, just to prove that ku was also part of the very divine healing aspects, forgiving aspects, growth aspects, uh, uh, of of man of humankind, not just not just the killing part. So these images are why eight or nine feet tall as well, and there he carved them in the paukukino. Paukukino is when you just carve the upper torso; it's just part of the body. So this was also a style that was very prevalent during the 19th century. The very last carvings that were carved here in Kona. So uh, the, this, this, heiau, this heiau, these images were created for the Army Museum to commemorate the fact that they had found 39 distinct burials on the grounds when they were refurbishing the grounds. And there, the speculation was that these burials were part of the last battle of Nu'uanu, and they were just buried there in their head, in their compound because this was where that Fort de Russi is now was a huge compound of Kamehameha's men. So having done that, Rocky said, well, and the Army Museum didn't want us to tell anybody that. That was really hush-hush. <laughs> we don't want to know, anybody to know that there are 39 burials here. And so, well, okay. But it's been 11 years now, so it's like I'm going to say it. The reason he carved this, then he had a purpose, in other words, is what I'm saying. He had a purpose. Oh, we, I, we found this out. This is fabulous. So these, this, the name of this monument is Nalehua Helele, which, uh, which translates into the scattered Lehua blossoms, meaning those warriors who died in battle, their souls scattered like the petals of the Lehua. And uh, we have the, um, the auxiliary, the sons and daughters of Kamehameha, the royal order of Kamehameha, the women's auxiliary. They take care of this image every three or four months. They wash every image. They replace the pennants. And they make sure that the cracks are measured and checked so that it can last for as long as it can last. It's already been up for 11 years, and it still looks absolutely beautiful. Now, because I've told you that each ku, that, that kunu yakea has the many aspects, kunu yakea is an elemental, I no longer want to use the word gods and goddesses because that really is misinterpretation within the culture. They had no gods and goddesses, just like none of our ancient cultures did. This is something that was, that was set forth by a Christian uh, uh, community that wanted to define the difference between this and that. 
the Maori believed in, Maori throughout the Pacific and all of our other ancient cultures throughout the world believed that every aspect in nature has an iconography or they create the iconography for it to represent it. These are not gods and goddesses to them because they believe they are part and parcel of nature. They are not separate from it. They are as a flower. They are as a tree. The flower and tree blossom, buds, blossoms, lives, dies, comes back the next season, and they believe so did they. So these are, now I'm trying to introduce the term elementals. These are elementals. So this is the elementals of the human side or the passionate side of man in all of its many, many myriad concepts. Having said that, then you realize that when these coups are carved, each one is very different from the other. There, there are no two alike. You might think so if you don't understand or not drawn into the reason for being. But if you look at each one of them minutely, they are very, very different. But there is a language that each carver had to follow. I like to call this the language of ku, but this is the language of art itself. Uh, many today like to say, well, Hawaiians didn't have a word for art. Everything they did was, you know, art. Uh, crafts, this, no. This isn't true. Those things that were created to house a spiritual entity, whether it be nature-based or ancestral-based, was sacred art. Very different from the person who made bowls and poi pounders, although all of those, all of those disciplines were very well respected, but they were very, very different from one another. The term that we like to use when we deal with the sculpting of elemental or ancestral images is makaku, which is the eye that holds true to the vision that you must create. I like to use this image because it explains every little tiny line that is on the, 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 the statue, the icon. These are not idols, these are icons. So we start with the headdress. The headdress of all ku images are feathers. They represent feathers. Ku is the hawk. And no better place than this island do you understand the hawk because it is the only island that has it flying in its skies. No other island has the hawk. Ku is the hawk. So Ku's headdress is always feathers. And if you read, <laughs> there are so many books that give you 500 different interpretations of Ku's headdress. But believe me when I tell you, he represents the hawk, the eel. Then you go to the eyes. The eyes are very passionate eyes, whether you're happy or angry or it shows emotion. And the eyes are emotional. They convey emotion of every type and kind. Then you have the nose, the nose there, when you have the eyes that are emotional and you have that expression. The expressions in, in all of the images were meant to convey energy, mana, to convey uh, spiritual power. This is why you see them that way. The missionaries called them grotesque because they couldn't understand, well, why are you carving in this way? They didn't carve what the eye could see, they carved what the spirit felt. So if they felt your energy, they were gonna show that in its carvings. And if you see some of the ancestral pieces, the ancestral pieces are very beautifully fashioned. They're not, they don't have the energy of ku. So there are both. Both were included in, their, in the skill, and that's why there is a language to all imagery. Now today the problem that I have is everyone who carves just carves. Many of them really don't know the language of ku, or the language of any of the other images. And so you will see many reproductions without, uh, without the true understanding of what the different 
the different iconography is within the image. This is a perfect example of showing you from the feather tips to the talons of the bird, the feet, they're perched. He's perched. He's in the ha stance. That's the stance of the warrior, of the wrestler, of the, of the, of the dancer, of the very, very famous style of its time. The olohe, the kuialua, was a martial art form that was very prevalent during the time that these images were carved. So you see that the breath of life is high up in the chest. It's in the intake of the breath, and his hands are just like this, his clenched fist on the side. This was a very popular stance in not only the martial art form, but in dance as well. So it shows there again energy and motion. All of the coup images of this.